Uh, if you guys would just bow your heads with me once more, uh, let's go before God. Lord, there are in this room hundreds of experiences throughout the week that distract and discourage and distort. And Lord, when we come together as your people, uh, we come to uh, sometimes in ways that are gentle, to be massaged by your word where there is tension in our lives. And sometimes, uh, like an old rug, we get uh, hung up on a branch and beat with grace. (laughs) And so we need this. We need your word to soak through us. Uh, We need your word to orient our hearts towards you. And it is all a grace that you've given it to us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So, 42, or 20, 2,042 years ago, I'll start there. Uh, 2,042 years ago, the Roman poet Horace provided for us a philosophy of life. Before millennial ever YOLO'd, before Forrest Gump ever said life is like a box of chocolates, Horace reflected on life, and he said this, Ask not, it tis forbidden knowledge, what our destined term of years Mine and yours, nor scan the table of Babylonish seers. Better far to bear the future like the past, whether many winters to give, or this our last. This that billows spend their strength against the shore. Strain your wisdom, life is short, should hope be more. In the moment of our talking, envious time has ebbed away. Seize the present. Trust tomorrow, even as little as you may. Well, most of us have probably never heard that poem. I don't think I had heard it in its context prior to this week. You have heard Horace's life philosophy, which is carpe diem. In the last line, seize the day. Seize the present. Enjoy the moment. And not too distant from our postmodern world today, Horace looks out to the world and he considers two things. The randomness of life and the brevity of it. We don't know what's coming, but we know it's short. And in considering those two realities, he provides a conclusion. Seize the day. Enjoy the moment. Take the present. Make the most of every opportunity. And interestingly enough, he's not too far removed from what God tells us in his word. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, says, Make the most of your time, for the days are wicked. Solomon encourages us in Ecclesiastes to enjoy life, to enjoy what is good, to enjoy what is hard, for this is what God has given to you. In our text today, Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, is also calling God's people to consider today. In fact, 57 times in Moses' sermon in the book of Deuteronomy, he is calling them and calling us to consider today, to seize the moment. Why? Why is it that throughout Scripture, the God of the world is after the way in which we view our immediate? It's because what actually happens is when it comes to planning, when it comes to living, when it comes to engaging this world, each of us does what Horace did. We look out and we make some sort of consideration on what we see, and in light of what we see, we let that motivate our actions. We consider what we see and we act out of that consideration to the end that we want to make the most of our life. But what Solomon, what Paul, and what Moses today are communicating to us in the book of Deuteronomy is that if we have bad observations, poor considerations, everything we hope to have in our moment, in our seizing of the day, in the seek the adventure, will amount to nothing, and you'll miss it all. You'll miss it all, even though that's what you spend all of your energy pursuing. In other words, when we look at the Bible's mentality for life, the Bible's philosophy for life, there might be more things to consider than simply what we don't know 
and the brevity of life. There might be more to consider when it comes to planning and experiencing life than your career. There might be more to consider when you weigh a life well lived than how many mountains you've climbed, than how long you've been married, than if you've been married. It's not that any of those things don't matter, but it's that there might be things that matter more. There might be more to consider. My daughter has taken up climbing trees. She looks at trees, and she considers it and says, I can climb it. What she hasn't considered is what happens when she gets to the top. (laughs) And for many of us, we run the same risk. We consider part of what is true, but not all of what is true. And whenever we do that, we get ourselves into sticky situations. And Moses is looking at a people who are sitting across a river from the land of promise, the land of unending opportunities. And he's calling them to consider what matters, to consider the things that will lead to good things in this life. Out of all the things that matter, all the good things that God has given, these are what we want you to consider so that you might make the most of today. And today in Deuteronomy 11, if you have your Bibles, we'll be there. It's in the bulletin. We have Bibles in the back if you want to grab one. We're going to see three things that Moses is calling God's people, which I pray is you, to consider. The first is that they would consider God. Second, that they would consider God's gift. And then having those considerations in place, now consider today. Now consider how it is you might act. Moses wants God's people to think differently so that they might act differently, and we should ask ourselves why. Why do we care what Moses is saying? Why would the Israelites care about what Moses is saying? And that's because nine times in the Sermon of Deuteronomy, Moses says, listen to this so that you might live long in the land, or that it might go well with you in the land. And interestingly enough, Moses, who is for the good of his people, talks about something we'll see in Deuteronomy 11.21, where he says there's something eternal about this reward of land. There's something beyond what you can understand about this land. And in fact, when we're hearing the words of Moses, we actually see that it is God himself who wants what's best for his people, and he actually wants you to think far bigger than today. He wants you to think about eternity. And contrary to what the world might say, when Christians think about eternity, it's not to the neglect of today. It's not that these things don't matter, but what happens is we actually pull the weight of eternity into today and make decisions based off of that. And this is the first thing Moses wants you and the Israelites to consider when it comes to how we live. And the first is that we would learn, first and foremost, to consider God. Consider God. Read with me part of what Eric just read for you. Deuteronomy 11, verses 1 through 7. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I'm not speaking to your children who have not seen or known it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, and how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them after, as they pursued after you, how the Lord destroyed them to this day, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place, And what he did to Daphne and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did. So six times in this chapter, six times in chapter 11, Moses is encouraging God's people to listen, to obey, to keep the commandments that God is giving. And what is the sum of God's command that we've seen so far in Deuteronomy? We've seen it before and we see it again in verse 13 of chapter 11, to love the Lord your God and serve him. What does God require of us? That we would love him. Why should we love God? 
If someone kicked down the door of your home and said, love me, it'd be weird. But you'd also want to consider why this person would be calling you to love them. And Moses gives the first point. Why should you consider God? And he says here, because this God is the only God. There is no other God. And then he says, consider what you, Israel, have seen. He gives them a little history lesson. What has happened recently in Israel's history that ought to cause Israel in all things to consider God? He gives four quick things. He says, remember Egypt. Remember the signs, the ten plagues I did to deliver you people without an army, without any political leverage, to deliver you from the mightiest nation on the face of the planet. Remember how I did that? And then he says, remember the Red Sea. But what's interesting is he doesn't say, remember how you passed through. He says, remember how that big, mighty nation, they got upset that I had taken you out. And they changed their mind. And that big, mighty nation and all their big, mighty horses, they pursued after you. Remember what I did then? Remember the same water you walked through? Remember how it destroyed them? How even the mightiest nation cannot come back and reclaim the people whom I have redeemed. And these first two points point to God's power to deliver. I delivered you from Egypt once. I delivered you from Egypt twice by my power. But then the next two points actually emphasize God's ability to discipline. He says, remember the wilderness years. Remember when after I had brought you out, we brought, went to the promised land to Kadesh Barnea, door number one to the promised land, and we said, go in. And you said, no, there are big people and tall walls. And remember how I disciplined you and made you wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And even in that, I provided for you. Your feet didn't swell. I swell. I gave you manna from heaven. Quail hopped onto the barbecue. I led you by a pillar of fire. And then remember, Dathan and Abiram, two men who tried to lead a rebellion in God's people, to lead them back to Egypt. Remember what happened to them, how I judged them, how the earth split and consumed them and all of their things for their sin. And after this brief history lesson, Moses concludes with this. For your eyes have seen all the great works of the Lord that, you, that he did. He said, you've seen this mighty God and his power to deliver from the hardest of all circumstances. You've seen there is nothing that keeps the power and affection of this God from working for the welfare and love of his people. But you've also seen that should you reject this God, that he is faithful to discipline. So knowing the God who is faithful to deliver and the God who is faithful to discipline, wouldn't you want to be the one who is delivered? (laughs) Wouldn't you want to trust that this God is able to do all those things continually to those who seek him? If a God like this exists, why wouldn't you want him on your side? He is gracious to those who seek him and he is just to those who reject him. At this point, we enter ourselves into this story. And maybe you've been that person when considering Christianity. Or maybe you have a neighbor you've been sharing the gospel with, and you say, man, if only God could cause Sweet Peaks ice cream to rain on their house during the day. Then they'll know. Then they'll know that this God is God. Sweet, salty caramel ice cream raining from heaven. But the truth is, when you look at the history of Israel in the Old Testament... The average Israelite at any point in time in the course of Israel history didn't see some miraculous event. The average Israelite relied on the eyewitness testimonies of those who did see miraculous events. They come to the same place you do of reading God's word. And even outside of God's word, don't we see, don't we encounter things that that ought to make us consider God? As we explore nature the depths of space, the complexity of the human body, the transcendent experience of seeing a beautiful piece of art or hearing a beautiful piece of music or eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich and we come to grips with the reality that there's something bigger than us. Doesn't the whole of our existence show that we are not made to be satisfied in and of ourselves? The fact that we pay money to go to movies and not to stand in front of a mirror points that there's something outside of us that is meant to stimulate, to excite, to satisfy. And on a realistic level, 
Moses could easily stop here and say, there is a God. He is mighty to deliver. He is right to discipline. Obey him. If a God like this exists, the creator, the authority, the king, you ought to obey him. Just as being born in America means that you are subjected, like it or not, to the American authority and everything that goes along with it. Being made in the image of God, you are subjected to this king, whether you realize it or not. And to not give homage to this king, to not obey this king, is to be counted among the rebels. And every time, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, we look at this great place we live and we see the fingerprints of God everywhere. We encounter the transcendent experience of nature. You are seeing that there is a God. There is something bigger than you and but our hearts, Paul says. They reject it. Instead of seeing God through creation, our eyes only try to see God in creation. We try to... Find God in what he has created instead of letting what God has created lead us to the God who's created. That's the problem of our broken heart. We can't on our own see this God. But this is why when you focus on what Moses is saying, he's saying, look at what he's did. And what does that lead us to? Listen to his word. God speaks to us. He doesn't just exist and drop hints of himself everywhere. He gets a bullhorn and speaks to our heart. He says, here I am. Listen to me. I am a God who is righteous and pure, but I am also a God who is good and desires to give good things to his people. His word reveals not only that he exists, but the kind of God he is, that he is gracious to redeem and just to discipline. What he wants God's people to know is not just that God exists, but the second point, to consider God's gift. Consider that God exists and consider the gift that God gives. And in this context, it's the promised land. Moses is preparing his people who have been by grace brought out of Egypt to obey God's law so that they might live in the promised land. And he wants them specifically to know two things about the land, two things that we're going to address here, kind of two sub points. First, he wants them to see that the land is unique from anything else. The land that God is giving, the gift that God is giving is unique from anything else in all the world. But then second, he wants them to see that the land is unique in its relationship to God. The land is unique from the world, and it is unique towards God. And looking at uniqueness from the world, look at verses 8 through 12. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land you're going over to possess And that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you're entering to take possession of is not like the land of Egypt from which you've come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from beginning of the year to the end of the year. So with Deuteronomy 11 ringing in our minds, what we just read, remember Dathan and Abiram, who he just talked about. Consider what they said during their rebellion in Numbers 16, in contrast to what Moses is now saying. So this is Numbers 16, verses 12 through 14. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. And they said, so this is them saying to Moses, we will not come up, we will not come to you. Is it a small thing you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey? They're calling Egypt the land of milk and honey nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So both these men resist God and Moses by saying, you took us out of the land of milk and honey. Can you gouge out our eyes? In other words, can you make us unsee everything that we're seeing right now? And to understand this a little bit, We need to to understand a little bit of the geography in this situation. 
Egypt was a land that, like kind of the Middle East and North Africa, didn't get a lot of rain. But Egypt had a really good thing going for it in the Nile River. And with the Nile River and the Nile Delta and the seasonal flooding, it was so rich for agriculture and for farming. In fact, I did, um, I used the wonderful means of grace God has given us this week of Google Maps. And I went online and I looked at the, the, the Nile area from the satellite view, and it is just death everywhere. But then this line of just green lushness that grows and grows and grows and grows. And then I move up to the northeast a little bit, and it's just more death. <laughs> it's just gray, dirt, rock, and right there in the middle of it, it says Israel. I don't think Dathan and Abiram were fools. They saw the green, lush paradise of Egypt. And they looked out and they said, that doesn't look the same. Can you make us unsee this? This doesn't look good. But Moses says, you guys have it all wrong. Why? They're not considering everything. You're not considering God. This land is not like the land of Egypt. It's like nothing you've ever experienced. It doesn't look at all like the land that you built as a slave in Egypt because this is a land that God builds. In Egypt, you had to irrigate. You got water from the Nile. You built aqueducts. You sent it out into the countryside. In this land, God is the gardener. God is the one who brings rain from heaven. You don't have to worry about moving your sprinklers in the promised land because God is going to do it. God cares for this land. It's not the land that's special. It's the God of the land that's special. It's unlike anything you've ever seen, people of Israel. I read a book, congratulations to me, the other day. Uh, and, the, and in it, the author made a statement that one of the primary shaping forces in geopolitical politics is air conditioning. Air conditioning. He says in the mid-1900s, when air conditioning was made accessible and affordable at a broad level, there was a huge amount of conservative people who lived in the North, conservative politically, who now moved to the climate-controlled comforts of Florida. And from the mid-1900s on, Florida had, or prior to the mid-1900s, Florida had elected, given its electoral votes, to a Republican president four times. Since the migration in the mid-1900s, Florida has given its electoral votes to a Republican, to a Democratic president five times. A complete switch. And, if you want to look at the course of most recent American politics, the last four years, Whomever it is that Florida gives its electoral college votes to has won the election, the last ele few election cycles. More than that, he says, typically the, the metropolitan areas of the world that controlled global politics like New York and London are now being rivaled by the new megacities. Megacities that they predict, predict by 2030 will be the primary Shakers in megacities, cities like Delhi, cities like Sri Lanka, cities like Karachi, cities which 50 years ago were struggling in population because of how the heat made it inhospitable. But now, people are moving there and gathering there and voting there and creating product there and trading there. The entire global economy is being changed by air conditioning. And if a box that fits in your window can shape the inhospitable landscape of the world, how much more can a God like this shape the deserts of your life? How much more change can a God who exists and gives good gifts to his people change your life? You see, when it comes to the Israelites, following God through the law, when it comes to New Testament believers following Jesus through discipleship, it's common. You should ask yourself this question. Can following God really give me what I want? Will it get me where I need to go? 
And Moses' answer is not only a resounding, yes, look at what you've seen, but it also begs the question, who else can? If this God can't do it, who else can? And he makes this point by talking of all things, rain. Out of all the things God could use to show his outstretched arm and his mighty power and his covenant-keeping faithfulness, he chooses rain, which works great on a college campus. Like, you go out and you say, hey, all of these religions, ones that offer you like a bunch of wives when you die or your own planet or monetary success, like, you understand, we've got rain, (laughs) It seems silly to us that this would be the point that God makes regarding rain. But rain in this culture was everything. In fact, the two primary religions at this time that coexisted in the promised land were fertility cults, meaning that the people who followed these fertility cults would do lewd and violent sexual acts to incite the gods to send rain to make the earth fertile with fruit. And their mind, the dry season was when these gods got so bored with dealing with humanity, they go off to underworld Las Vegas or something like that. Wherever they go, they're like winter like snowbirds. They leave. And during that time, the people get anxious. They see the fertility has moved away. So they do more panic-stricken rituals trying to convince these gods to come back so that they could have fruit so that they could have rain. They understood that if there was no rain, there was no food. If there was no food, there was no produce. If there's no produce, there's no economy. If there's no economy, there's no food. If there's no economy, there's no home. If there's no economy, there's no safety. If there's no no economy, there's no security. You see, none of us long for rain like this, but each of us know the rain we hope for, don't we? We know what it is that we think provides for us the economy that sustains our life. The affection we seek, the satisfaction we strive for, the spouse we long for. And we do the craziest rituals to get it. And we know the paranoia that comes when we feel like the thing who gives it has gone away on a vacation. And here Moses is like, this God in this land doesn't need three months off. He watches the land. He cares for the land. He brings the rains when it needs it, and he does not turn away from it. See, Moses is saying, There is one God out of all the false gods you hope for who can bring you the gift of satisfaction. And the beauty of it is that Moses and the rest of God's revelation define this satisfaction. You see, following God is not merely that the problems of your life get solved. It's not that this is one of other options is that this culminates in something greater. And look at what uh, the author of Hebrews, who is writing to, I'll give you a hint, to the Hebrew people, to people who know the Old Testament promises. He is writing, he's going to write in Hebrews chapter 11, you could turn there if you want to, and he's going to be speaking of these Old Testament people in Deuteronomy, these promised land-bound people who are hoping in a land. And look at what he says in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. See, already, there's something more than the promised land, isn't there? These people who are about to get the land still didn't get what was promised. There's something bigger. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. We're seeking a land where it rains. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunities to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. 
for he has prepared for them a city. You see, Moses, this is big, Moses in all of Deuteronomy never calls the people to hope in the land. He calls them to hope in God. And as they hope in God, they get the promise of land, which God says is a future city, a heavenly city, a city which one day the new heavens and the new earth will descend from heaven and all who are bought by the blood of Jesus will live in this rain-soaked city forever. You see, it's in Jesus where God solves the problem of sin that you might not be aware of that you had and provides for you a reward you never thought possible. Life with God in his perfect place. The hope of Christianity is unlike anything else you've ever seen. We think we just have superficial problems, but at the core, our problem is that we are without God. And God is calling us to him. God is not one option among many for satisfaction, for meeting worldly needs. God is the only option in this world to solve our greatest need. AT&T has this campaign out for commercials right now. It just says, just okay is not good enough. But we always are looking out in this world for what's just okay but it won't get the job done. If you're not a believer in here today, I want you to consider that if a God like this exists, it's only the God who created you who can save you. The God who never takes a break. The God who is mighty to save. But then when you understand that, I want everyone to consider in here what that satisfying salvation actually looks like. Because if we don't understand the way in which God saves us, if we don't understand what he has saved us to, we are going to constantly be just like the pagan people in the land, paranoid that our gifts are being taken from us. And this is where Moses continues to remind the people of what the reward is. This is where we see how the land is unique in its uh, relationship to God. This is Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 17. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you He will shut up the heavens, so there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord your God is giving you. So here we see the giftedness of God's gift. I'm going to give you rain, but I can take it away. I'm going to give you produce, but I can take it away. I'm going to give you the land, but I can wipe you off of it. Why would God do that? Because look back at Deuteronomy eleven sixteen. Take care, lest your heart be deceived. In other words, what it was really saying is, is in, in the literal Hebrew, like that you be so open minded, and you turn aside, and serve other gods, and worship them. It's five times already. We're in Deuteronomy chapter eleven, just about a third of the way through the book. Five times Moses has already pleaded with his people saying something like this. Take care lest you forget. Lest you be deceived. And his point here is is as he's talking about this wonderful God, this God who saves, he says do not let God become mundane. Because to lose God is to lose God's gift. To lose God is to lose God's gift. You see, God's not being a child who's taking his ball and going home if the people reject God and pursue other gods. 
Very literally, the moment they reject God and they serve other gods, they have already turned their back on the gift. The gift was never the land. The gift was a right relationship with the God of the land. The truth is, you don't need rain. You need God. And that's the reward of the gospel. Behind all of your needs is the reality that without God, you are in judgment. But in Jesus Christ, God has sent his son to bring a people who have broken his covenant, who have earned a wiping off of the land, and he brings them back to God. Behind all of our needs is God. And now Hebrews, taking the author of Hebrews, takes this rain analogy again, and it talks about what rain looks like. If you want to know, has God given you rain in your heart? Has God caused you to have the very things that provide comfort and satisfaction and peace? The very things that Datham and Abiram and Moses is calling people to long for, but saying it is God who gives. Look at what that rain looks like in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 through 12. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and in its end it's burned. So there we see, when rain falls, you're blessed from God. What is this blessing? Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, that you might not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises the reign of God, what it is that you need in a desert world is the better things of salvation. The benchmark of fruitfulness is God's grace to you through Jesus Christ. That through your salvation, you would inherit all of the promises of God and to reject that God is to face the judgment of God, to be wiped off and out of the promised land. You see, I think, I feel like I'm not being a heretic to say this, that God knew San Diego would exist. He knew Hawaii was going to be around. And he still sent his people to a promised land that looks like the surface of Mars. And I think it's to show us. It was certainly to show Israel that when we look at our world, we must consider it through the eyes of faith that is dry, as dangerous, and as difficult as whatever God might be putting in front of you right now to have the salvation of God through Jesus Christ and your sins taken care of by his sacrifice is to have in the midst of that desert rain which satisfies. One day, we'll look around and we'll be in the garden city. We see that in Revelation. We're back to the garden. We're back in a land as rich as Egypt but without any of the threats. And that's what Jesus brings us to. And we can have a glimpse of those promises right now through faith. And so Moses is saying, when it comes to today, people, do you consider that God and his gift? His ability to redeem and the judgment which comes from rejecting him. Because only when you understand what this God has done, who he is and how he has spoken to you through his word and given you his promises, only then can you consider everything. Only then can you climb a tree and not get stuck in the top of it. Only then do you know what you need to seize the day. And it's here where now Moses calls them. He says, in light of this, here's the last point, consider today. 
If our greatest need is a God who saves and our greatest problem is neglecting this God, then shouldn't our lives show these priorities? Shouldn't our lives cling to things that cause us not to forget? And there is a very, don't mistake this. This text is demanding something from you today. Moses is pleading that these Israelites would make a decision today to honor this God. And in this closing part of the chapter, we see four ways, four practical points that you could take from here that help shape your life, that help seize the day in a way that honors God. And this is what we're going to see in the closing verses shortly. Here are the four things. We're going to see that God wants us to learn God's word, to share God's word, to show God's word, and to see God's word. I tried really hard to make all of them S's, but it just didn't work out. So we're going to start with learn. Learn, share, show, and see. We see the first of these in verses 18 through 25. So here you go. See if you can see these in this text. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. So there's Moses' hint that this land, something unique. It might not be about this physical land. It might be about something more. For if you be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you. You will dispossess nations greater and greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread on all the land that you tread as he promised you. And so we see in verse 18 the first response. If you want to remember, what should you do? Therefore, he says, learn God's word. That's verse 18. Lay it up in your heart and in your soul. How? Moses makes it clear. Write it on your hand and staple it to your forehead. And there have been people who do things like this throughout church history. And you could maybe do that, but it probably won't work. It might be easier to just read the Bible and seek God inside of it. That if this God has provided for us everything we want in our salvation from sins through Jesus Christ, then wouldn't we want to have it ready at our hand, at the top of our mind? Wouldn't we want to learn to cherish it, to know it, to delight in it? In the same way, when I get lost in a crowd, which which often happens, and I'm looking for my wife, I know what she looks like. I know what she sounds like. I know that she's already doing the adult thing to try and find me. When you want to learn something in our day and age, You go to YouTube, and you watch a video, you learn how to do it. But many of us, when we want to know God, when we want to experience the promise of God, we sit there on our couch hoping that something miraculous will magically happen to us. God has shown us himself. He has given us his promise. He is speaking to us. And so you'll hear more about this later, but starting in the new year, we have a Bible reading plan that we're going to give to all of us. I'm going to encourage our whole church to do it together so that we might remind each other that when we're not hearing God in the word, we could make our own bullhorn and yell at each other through God's word to learn that. And that's what transitions then to the second point. When we learn it, we also learn to share God's word, right? Deuteronomy 11, 19. You shall teach them to your children talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Share it with your children. Share it on the way to work. Share it when you're at work. Share it when you're going to bed. Share it all the time. This is, uh, if you go back and you look at Deuteronomy 6, I think starting in verse 4, this text we're looking at in Deuteronomy 11 is almost verbatim of what's said there. And that passage of Deuteronomy 6 is a really uh, important passage to Jews today. It's called the Shema, which is the Hebrew word for hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. They go on to recite all these things that you should do. Twice a day, every Jew recites that. 
people, those Jews are still waiting for their promise. But Christians, we have seen the promise of God in Jesus Christ. Shouldn't we who have seen the full revelation of Moses' promises in Jesus be more ready to share this with our world? Shouldn't we want others to see? Shouldn't we want to remind ourselves? Because actually when we share the gospel with people, two things happen. One, we get better at it. Evangelism is hard. It's difficult. We stumble over our words. Every time I share the gospel with someone, I go home and I'm like, I sounded like an idiot. But you know what? God was really pleased by it. And the more we share it, the clearer it becomes. The more we practice sharing God's word, the more comfortable we become doing it. It becomes more clear to us. But also, here's the wonderful thing, is we're not sharing mere words. We are not transferring mere information. We speak the power of God, which means as our children, as our coworkers, as our neighbors hear it, by God's grace, some of them will be dead men brought to life. And we will say, who is this God that does such mighty things? To have seen his outstretched arm and his mercy. And if it worked for them, it's certainly going to continue to work for me. Share God's word with those who are around you. And then we see lastly in just this part that he wants us to show God's word. Verse 20. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Get all bumper stickers, cover your car, drive down the street, Wear only Christian clothing. No, it's not necessarily what he's talking about here. But what he is talking about, in here, when you go into someone's house, when you go into their city, when someone visits your, your community group or your house or sits with you at lunch, they should notice there is something unique here. That this is different. Last week, we looked at Moses' command, this odd command, which only God does in Jesus Christ, to circumcise hearts. And those who have circumcised hearts ought to also have circumcised homes, habits, and hopes. It should be different. It should be unique. It should be set apart. And so I encourage you, those who are meeting in community groups this week, what does it look like for your community group to show God's word? To be something that's not like a Kiwanis club or a social hour or a play date, but to be something where at its root, those who are here are different. They have a Hebrews 11 hope, not in this city, but in a city which is yet to come. And here's the thing, is when we hear these commands, we're we're so arrogant. Um, I am. I won't put it on you. I'm so arrogant. When I hear these, I'm like, well, of course God wants me to do this. He needs me to do this. He needs me to share the gospel. He needs me to show the gospel because if not me, nothing's happening for the church, right? But that's not the point. Remember, it says, if you forget these things... You're in danger. Therefore, do these things. These things are not because God needs your help. These things are because God desires your good. He wants you to be reminded of his goodness every day so that you don't get distracted by the gifts that God gives and pursue other false gods. He wants you to know that this God is good. So to neglect these, if you are wrestling with your walk with God, do these things. These don't make you saved, but these remind you of the goodness that God has given you in the gospel. This is the start to experiencing God's goodness that it might endure you. But in the last point, Moses gives in closing, there's no command to do at all. This is where Moses calls us to see God's word. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 32. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way I'm commanding you today and go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land, says bring you into the promised land and you're entering to take possession of it, You shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, towards the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the Oak of Moriah? Why is he including that? He's like, you guys know these mountains. (laughs) They've got addresses. For you are to cross over the Jordan and go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you possess it and live in it, you shall be careful to do all the statutes and rules 
I am setting before you today. So Deuteronomy 27, when we get there, we're going to see this kind of odd illustration laid out. Most you've ever been numbered at PE, like one, two, one, two, one, two. Well, this one's like blessing, curse, blessing, curse, blessing, curse. Most goes through the whole people, and uh, the lucky ones get to go up on Gerizim and, and be the representative of the blessing. The other ones get to go on Mount Ebal and be the representatives of the curse. And why is he doing this really odd thing? Because he wants his people to know that as physical as these mountains are, as real as they stand there today, so is the choice you have every day in the promised land. When you look to the east, and you see those mountains, you see blessing, and you see curse. When you have guests who come into Missoula, and they drive from the airport straight down Broadway, what's the first question they ask? What's the L and the M? And you explain it to them. This is what Moses is doing with these mountains that you might know God has offered you something, who will you choose? Will you obey? In Missoula, we've got those two mountains, and maybe it's a good reminder for you. Maybe it's a good teaching point for your kids today to actually talk about those two mountains in the context of God's blessing and God's curse. But there is actually something more certain, more clear, more prominent that the gospel tells us to look at when it comes to understanding and seeing God's blessing and God's curse. And that's the cross of Jesus Christ. On the cross of Jesus, we see so clearly the curse of sin. The sin that Moses talks about. A sin which is not murderous. A sin that is not embezzling. A sin that is none of the superficial sins that we see in our society. But a sin of lovelessness towards God which demands death. But on the cross, we see the blessing of God. That God has offered to die in your place that God's grace has come and you can see without a shadow of a doubt not just that blessing and curse exist but that there is a man who stands in between them bearing the curse and giving the blessing. When you see the cross, when you think of the cross, do you think of today? Do you think that God cares about how you respond today? To those who have never considered, consider today the gospel. Consider today that there is blessing and there is curse. There is a God who has shown his faithfulness to bless and his faithfulness to curse. And the only way for the cursed to become blessed is through Jesus Christ. To repent and believe. And to those who have responded, Do you consider today that he's still just as good? That in this desert, there is a Jesus who brings rain into our hearts and gives us the hope of a city eternal. When sin is so near and the sun is so hot, we can say, I know the blessing because I've seen it. I know today I can respond obediently because I know what was purchased for me in eternity. May we as a church be people who first and foremost consider this. And from this, we seize the day, we enjoy the moment in a way where the world looks at us and says, give me that. Give me that hope. Give me that land. Give me that God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have offered yourself. But it is so, so easy in our hearts to worship the gifts of God instead of God himself. When we worship the gifts of God, we get bored with God. When we worship the gifts of God, we look to other things which seem to offer gifts that are less costly. When we worship the gifts of God, we become frustrated because we fail to realize that it's never the gifts that satisfy, but the God who stands behind it. Lord, cause our hearts to not be deceived by seeing even more clearly the weight of today in the blessing and curse of the cross. Make us a people motivated to learn, to share, to show, and to see your word. 
so that it might go well with us and with our children and with our city and with the nations for your glory and for our good. We pray this in your name. Amen.